This video is about making observations of cement hydrating at the nano scale. My name is Tyler Lay, and I am always looking for new ways to learn about concrete. What is this about? Well, if we can learn how a game is played or how something is important works, then we have a chance to win. We have a chance to change the game in our favor and do things in the right way. I just got back from Vegas. Yeah, Vegas, baby. And there is a place of games. And if you can learn how to play those games better, you got a chance to win, maybe. Our game that we're talking about today is how concrete goes from a wet, goopy thing to a hard as a rock thing that we're gonna use for the rest of our lives. How it changes from a slurry to a solid. And this is a picture of the birth curve of concrete. This is the time down here and this is the amount of heat that's given off. And after we mix the concrete and we place the concrete, eventually it gets to this point where it gives off heat and it starts to gain strength. And this is when it gets hard. And this is called the induction to the acceleration period. And this is the process that we're gonna study at the first. So why are we doing this? Well, if we can better understand and predict these reactions, then we can provide our industry a quantitative game-changing guidance. This can help reduce costs, avoid unsatisfactory material placement, improve durability and constructability. We can take normal, everyday concrete people and turn them into a concrete superhero. So why don't we know more? Well, the materials of this time period are crazy fragile, so they're hard to look at and study. And ideally, we would just sit back and watch the composition form and the structure evolve over time. Ideally, we would just have X-ray vision glasses that we could see what's going on. Now, we're gonna use these two pieces of equipment. One is a lab scale instrument from Zeiss, the Ultra 810, and one is a synchrotron. Most of this work's been done at Beamline 26 at Argonne National Lab. In both these systems, we can image at about 20 nanometers. That's about a thousand times smaller than a human hair. And we're able to see this in 3D without harming our structure. This is called X-ray computed tomography. We're gonna take, put our sample on a stage and send an X-ray signal through it. We're gonna take a picture of what makes it through to the other side. And then we rotate our sample and take another image and rotate it and take another and another and another. And we're gonna build a 3D model or a tomograph of the inside of our material. And if you have had a CAT scan done to your body, then you have had a tomograph done to you. In these tomographs, they give you images in gray values. These gray values are super valuable. They're an indication of the MAPS absorption coefficient or the chemistry and the density of the material. Therefore, when I see different gray values, I know I have either different chemistry, density, or possibly both going on. So if we see changes in gray value, what does that mean? It means we have a change in density, chemistry, or possibly both. Sometimes we need more information. And way, one way to do that is with another technique called nano X-ray fluorescence. And in this technique, you actually send an X-ray beam through your sample and all along that length, material is emits photons. And those photons can be detected and then you can determine the chemistry of all of the elements along that path. We can raster this over the surface and get an elemental map of the material. Now, what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna combine the 3D tomography with the 2D composition together to get a 3D composition. And this technique is called nanotaco. Nanotomography assisted chemical correlation or nanotaco. And when you develop something like we did at Oklahoma State, you can name it anything you want and we love tacos, so we called it nano taco. So in these experiments, we're gonna start out with this very, very small grouping of cement particles, actually C3S particles. And then we have this plastic cone, and this cone can move up and down. We're gonna take a 3D scan of the material before. We're actually gonna fill the cone up with a known solution. 
We're going to move the cone up over the material and let it, let it react and seal it with clay on top. We'll actually lock everything up in a nitrogen environment as well, so we don't have any carbonation occur. And then we're gonna remove it down, take the solution out, add an isopropyl alcohol and move it back up. And that's to stop reaction. That's to pull all the water out. Then we're gonna move the isopropyl down and take another 3D image. So we have a 3D image before and then we have a 3D image after hydration has occurred. So we're gonna be focusing on this curve down at first these very, very early ages to see what's going on. And here's an image before and after in 3D. And we're gonna talk about particles all throughout this. But first, we're gonna talk about these particles in the yellow box. Now, these particles, we can again look at them before and look at them after. Here are three different cross sections. And here are those cross sections shown, slices. And we can see what they look like before, and then we can see what they look like after two and a half hours. Now, I see some changes in gray value. What does that mean? That means a change in chemistry, a change in density, or possibly both going on. Also, I noticed in these gray value forms, it doesn't go outside of the boundary of the particle it stays inside the original boundary. How interesting. We're gonna call this for now the modified region. And we can calculate the volume of the original particle, the volume of the unreacted, the volume of the modified region, and get the percentage of the modified region of the particle. We can also look inside of it and see what's going on. Is this modified region just at the surface? Actually, it's not. It actually penetrates and goes inside the particle and we can measure it, the depth of penetration that each one of these modified regions go. And this is the depth of the modified region down here. And this is the distribution. This is like the probability distribution function of how deep are these reactions going to go. And we can see that on average, they're about 0.7 microns that they're digging or tunneling inside the cement particle. So the particle retains its original boundary, but only about 38% of the particles reacting. Isn't that wild? This localized reaction is only limited to certain regions and the depth of reaction can go deep up to 0.7 microns in depth. So why would some parts react and others not? Well, other folks have actually looked at these in TEM images. This is out of, out of Karen Scribner's group at EPFL. And they've noticed that some of these regions seem distorted or modified or strange. So that could be why some of them react faster than others. Here's another particle. This particle is, again, we're showing two different cross sections. Isn't it strange that right here it's not reacting at all, but right next to it, it's reacting a bunch? And this particle is actually showing cracks that are digging inside of it. And there's actually crevices inside the particle. What do I mean? Well, if I take away a chunk out of these particles, we can see there used to never be a crack here. It was solid and looked normal. It didn't look any different at all. And in this region, it's huge, deep pit that's being dug out of this particle. What? Here's another one. And this particle has only very, very limited reactions only on certain spots. The majority of it doesn't react at all. And then here's this particle. And this one almost totally reacts. It's almost 100% consumed by this reaction. So we have some particles that dissolve, some particles that change a lot, some particles that don't dissolve very much at all, yet they're all from the same batch of material. They're all supposed to be exactly the same, but this reaction is localized to certain parts and it's not uniform. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, you know what? I bet it's a function of the volume. And here's a plot of about eight different particles. And we're showing the volume that we've, we've racked up here. Okay, this is the highest volume versus the lowest volume particles. And this is the percentage of, of, of change. And it's not necessarily tied to the volume, as in we've got smaller particles that are reacting about the same as larger particles. It seems to be kind of random and it's something we don't understand right now. So what is this modified region? What is it made up of? Well, we're gonna use Nano XRF. If we look at the unreacted C3S or the cement, it matches exactly what we'd expect to see for that material. And this modified region, this region seems to be made up of something called inner 
CSH or inner product CSH. It seems to have a calcium to silicon ratio of about 1.7. It's very, very cool. The Nano X measurements for the unhydrated C3S is exactly what we'd expect them to be. And this modified region seems to be what some people call inner product CSH. So why is this useful? Well, if we could get more of our cement particles to hydrate, we could get a lot more strength for less material. What if we could better control our set time by understanding how these react and to the extent that they react? And you have to, again, learn how the game is played before you can ever hope to change it. But what about later ages? Well, we can look at that, these later time periods. And here are particles before and after reaction. And again, we can look inside. We can use our x-ray vision to look inside the hydrated material. And we can see these unhydrous materials in the core and this hydration product around the outside, we can make it transparent. We can also get the pore structure. We can see the parts in red that are the connected voids. That means there's a pathway from the outside of the hydration product in. And then we can see the ones in blue that are disconnected. That means there is no path in. We can zoom in on this area here. You can see there's actually tunnels that lead into the hydration product. And these tunnels sometimes go into little pockets. Sometimes they go into very, very complicated passageways all through the hydration products. So we can see the pore structure of the hydrated concrete, and we can see the connectedness of the voids and better understand how they're oriented. So why is this valuable? What if we could find a way to shut these pores? This would help improve the permeability of the concrete. And all we'd have to do is figure out how to close up these little regions, either with hydration products or possibly put some kind of other material to plug that gap up. We have a new experimental setup though. It's totally awesome. We can take all kinds of C3S powder and pack it in, pack it in, pack it in, and then take 3D scans simultaneously as we inject water. We can get a water cement ratio of about 0.40. Our first scan starts about 18 minutes after hydration has started, and we can scan every four and a half minutes over the first 10 hours. Each scan only takes about four seconds, and we got a 50 nanometer resolution and we able to get continuous observations over time and here's an example of the data set it is in huge and frightening awesome and we're going to just focus on one particle today and watch for more videos about other stuff in the future let's watch this particle and see how it reacts and this particle at 18 minutes hasn't reacted much you can see here, and this is where we've segmented it or separated. We're just trying to make it easier for your eye to tell what is hydrated and what's not. And we've used this to build a 3D representation of the material. Now, after three hours, a lot of the material has changed. A lot of it's hydrated. This change in gray means it's changing. And this is what we call hydration product. And we can see in 3D what it looks like. And after three hours, there's even still little bitty holes of parts that haven't reacted yet. And now let's go to six, and then we get to nine. And what? What? What just happened? Some of the reaction products are going away. Let's go back to six, and then let's go to nine hours. We can see there's pores or holes being formed in our hydration product. Let's compare again the six hours to the nine hour. And not only do we have these time periods, we have every five minutes in between. We can make a movie of this entire process happening. This is pretty cool. So we can watch how these particles evolve about every five minutes. We can see the hydration products forming and dissolving after several hours. So why is this valuable? This impacts your strength gain, your permeability, your stiffness, your cracking, so many properties of concrete. This porosity formation is making our concrete worse. If we could find a way with admixtures or some other procedure to stop this, we could make a huge improvement in our concrete. So again, look at this six hours to nine hours. We don't want to lose all this hydration product that we've worked so hard to make. We wanna keep it in place. So let's talk about a view into our future. Our industry is extremely conservative because we're established. We're fat and we're happy. We're making money right now. We hate change and we do our best to stop it. But ladies and gentlemen, the world needs us to step up. 
Concrete is the second most used material by humans. We need to do everything we possibly can to make it the best product on the planet. And these tools can produce game changers for our industry. But who's going to be willing to step up? Who is going to fund this research? Who is going to devote their career and their lives to finding out these issues and building tools for our industry? I'm trying every day, but I need help. I need all the help I can get. And there's going to be immense rewards to those that are successful. I told you about going to Las Vegas. And I'll be honest, there was more money lost in the casino one of the nights I was staying there than all of the money that's spent on basic research to better understand concrete. This is a major issue. We need to stop this. In conclusion, Nano CT can give us insights to the 3D structure and Nano XRF can give us insights into 2D chemistry of our material. These two data sets can be combined to make crazy awesome observations about cement hydration. And I think we can extend these to almost anything we want to look at in concrete. If you like this video, please, Give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and leave me a comment below about if you think this is useful or not. Can you help? Can you make this happen? Take care, everybody. Bye.